Next up, uh, Deputy Secretary George McCauley is going to give us a little bit of an inside view uh, into PennDOT's 2018 operations. I know George is uh, a guy that understands the importance of working closely together. If we're ever going to accomplish anything, we're going to do it collectively, not individually. And I think he also understands the importance of trying to identify those people that are going to be sitting in these chairs 10 years from now. And we've, got to, we've got to open their eyes and get them to realize that these opportunities are real. And they're right here for them. George. Good morning, folks. To go along with the opening theme of the day, uh, most of the people that are in the room that know me know that I'm from Western Pennsylvania. Uh, I've always touted that I've had two favorite football teams. Uh, my first favorite, of course, is close to my home, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, several trophies on a wall and a nice room in Pittsburgh. My second favorite team has always been whoever's playing against the New England Patriots. <laughs> so I know that may upset a few, but my second favorite team won a Super Bowl this year. Good job. Now, and it's also nice to hear that the industry's talking about invigorating their efforts forward. I look forward to your Super Bowl parade. I'm sure it will mirror that that was held in Philadelphia. Um, I want to talk about a number of things today, um, give you a little background of where PennDOT is, where we've advanced some things in the last year, how we're trying to move some things along a little bit quicker pace, and some opportunity forward relative to innovation and relative to sustainability of work. I can make the technology work for me in good shape. There we go. Very excited about the opportunity to grow, partnering relationships with the industry and the department Federal Highway Administration working together to try to improve the transportation assets that we all work so hard to deliver. The listing here uh, of a lot of initiatives involving future leaders that started within the past year or so. Um, and it's good to hear that the Concrete Industries Interns for the Future program aligns with those concepts. Now, if you watched me step up on stage, you'll tell that you can easily tell that calisthenics aren't something that's in my daily ritual, in the shape that I'm in, and from the job that I do. But let's please all stand for a moment. I didn't think anybody would be sleeping today, but this this is a little different exercise. You got over 30 years in the business. Have a seat. You're like me, you're old, you're tired, you need to rest a little bit. Over 25 years, have a seat. I hope you're watching the crowd as you're, as you're still standing. Over 20 years, have a seat. And the folks that just sat down are carrying a torch right now, or should be. The folks that are still standing are the torch carriers of the future. Olympic torch needs to continue to be moving forward. So folks, those that are sitting are your mentors. And you folks need to lead this initiative into the future to advance and improve transportation for Pennsylvania. And since you were the most resilient, I thought I'd make you stand up. So you can have a seat now. So I'm very excited about all the efforts to try to evolve relationships that we put together and we try to build on those relationships because as Jeff had said I say on many occasions our best opportunity for success is found in solid relationships in anything that we do. Our secretary put forth a, a relationship scenario that's outside of the actual construction arena but plays heavily into what we do labeled PennDOT Connects building relationships with our uh, municipality partners, local communities, as we're scoping or prior to scoping projects, understand what their plans are for the future, 
and to make sure that we're accommodating for those in our projects. Now, what folks in the room need to understand is that, that our engineering districts went through a huge effort over the past year to really advance this program. Every district reports that they caught up on every project that was in the pipeline and picked up that type of communication with their local communities. And that will be the path forward for every project. But for the first year, that was the new stuff and everything that was in the pipeline yet to be delivered. So it was a huge effort. The reports are that we're getting a lot of positive feedback from all local communities, recognizing that they didn't understand the whole concept and they were very pleased with the relationship opportunities to recognize opportunities to incorporate what the planning partners and what the local municipalities want to do with their region and with the projects we're putting forward. So it's been an exemplary effort and it's been advancing very well. We owe the districts a lot of thanks for advancing that effort. The department has had a focus on improving diversity within transportation. PennDOT has put a lot of effort into developing programs to reach out to colleges, high schools, now the elementary school level as far as recruiting folks for the business that we're in. Of course, we particularly focus on the business departments involved in, but many of those discussions go to all transportation related discussions. We're also looking for improving the way we mentor folks, the way we build a sustainable organization so that folks can see a career path, succession planning offer. Sure, there are industry efforts along those lines that are parallel, and we talk about those to some extent. There's probably more opportunity to merge those efforts in the future. From a disadvantaged business contracting perspective, last year was the first year Pennsylvania and not put together three regional outreach sessions to try to grow opportunities for DBE contractors to participate in the work that we do. The Industry was very supportive in that effort, attended those sessions, had folks that spoke at each of those sections to recognize the type of work that we do. The department explained how to become business partners, how to be aligned to be able to be successful in building relationships with contractors as a sub, and how to, how to work to do that type of work for the future. Those were great sessions. Now we're looking at the opportunities to evolve that to the next level for the, for the coming year. I've asked folks to take a very hard look at how we manage our assets forward. We're trying to work to develop much better predictive models on how our transportation assets are performing and are expected to perform into the future. In the past, most of what we planned on was based on what we physically see as a reactionary type approach and a prediction based on age. We're working to build opportunities to understand the technologies that are in those assets, to know what the future looks like for that type of an asset forward, to try to build our program around that, and to be not so much reactionary, but more a proactive approach in planning our programs, trying to make sure we're doing the right projects at the right time. The pavement asset management system has been under development, and we're looking at a, an upgrade to that system later this year to help get it more in alignment with that type of a program. We've been developing a bridge asset management program. It's very similar. It's looking for about a 24-month deployment, but we have a BAMS light, bridge asset management system light, to give us some meaning of measure to recognize our bridge conditions and plan our programs around bridges with partial data uh, as the system is being developed. And all this is being driven to support the performance metrics that are driven by the Federal Highway Administration of course, their focus is on the federal aid system. We're looking at the entire system. So these programs we're putting together are looking at all of our assets, down to the lowest volume secondary roads in Pennsylvania. Talk a couple slides about PennDOT maintenance. It's the largest part of the organization that I get to oversee. And safety is one of our primary focuses. It's been on a renewed effort over the last several years to try to improve a safety culture. I'm sure safety is one of the number one things in each organization that you work for. I'm saddened to have to report that PennDOT lost one of our workers last Saturday. Upsetting flares in a snowstorm for an incident was impacted by another group. It's a tough thing to go through. I'll be heading to the visitation for that individual this evening. It's a dangerous business that we're in, and we need to do all that we can to guard ourselves from a safety perspective, our 
workers and the traveling public working through our work zone. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. Safety needs to always be the first focus of what we do. Our maintenance organizations have always been focused on quality and productivity. We're looking at new tools to measure the productivity that show them opportunities to compare and improve. We're also working on driving different ways of enhancing the quality of the maintenance efforts that we do. We're asking them to build quality control programs that are very similar to what the industry uses, uh, generating data that we can pull up and show the quality outcomes that we achieve. We're always looking at cost-effective practices, trying to do the best we can with the monies that we have, get as much bang for the buck. There's been an effort of equipment sharing that's been going on over the past several years and opportunities forward to improve upon that fleet size can be reduced to get the same amount of work done if we share equipment better. Just to give you an example of that, in the past it was viewed that the, every piece of equipment was owned by a particular county, 67 counties worth of equipment. Nobody would run a business with that small of a, a pocket of organization trying to be self-sustaining for equipment. We're working to build regional approaches to help reduce the fleet and still get the work done by equipment sharing scenarios. I've always asked our, motor, our folks in pen up maintenance to recognize that there's the three main categories of what we're there for. Winter maintenance is our first effort and we must be effective at maintenance in the winter time. That involves industry participation, of course, and we're looking for opportunities to expand that. But we are, as an organization, our structure of our organization is established based on being able to be successful at winter. When we come out of winter, our first, first focus and our planning efforts need to be taking care of core cyclical maintenance activities for our assets. And I can tell you that that has been slipping uh, over the last several years. And we've put an effort to reinvigorate that through the last year and we'll continue forward to make sure we take care of the core maintenance activities first before we plan to do higher type work with our crews. And when we do have capacity left over, which we will have, we want to be very cost effective and efficient with what we do with those crews. So over the past couple of years, each of those 67 counties went through answering hundreds of questions about how they run their business, trying to evolve their business model forward to be successful for the future. From that, the 11 different districts each came to central office that presented a business plan on county transformation, county accreditation, how they have recognized opportunities to improve their business and where their best practices are. So we could share those district to district, county to county, and we can help each of those 67 counties evolve their structure forward to be successful for the future. Let's talk about innovation for a few slides here. Innovation opportunities abound within transportation. Uh, one of the earliest things that I want to point to, want to, point to as I started this position that I'm in is that we have a system that's relied acceptance-wise in the construction industry on uh, random acceptance sampling and a uh, little bit of effort relative to quality control. But we don't, as an owner, rely on the quality control data that comes out of delivering the project. And I think we're missing a huge opportunity there. There are means and methods forward as to how to recognize the consistency of the products that we're creating because that will add to and increase the longevity of the products we're creating. So there's ample reason to not just do random, random sampling for acceptance, but understand the entirety of what we've constructed. Now our rapid bridge replacement project was the first P3 approach within Pennsylvania. It's been a struggle at times. We found our way through some difficult hurdles and we're advancing the project. We have 160 some bridges left to build. Uh, through the course of this year, some will carry a little bit in the 19th. Um, but from that effort, we also added to our knowledge of understanding that those quality control programs with today's technology can be tracked, data can be collected, shared, we can learn from things faster and improve what we're doing based on the opportunities available in today's technology. So we're taking those concepts forward in how we develop programs. We're always looking to continuously improve. And again, the focus for the future, in my view, is performance-based outcomes, recognizing consistent products, and 
only get to understanding how to deliver consistent products if you understand process capability. So there's a few key words for you to study on and learn for your future development. I've had a focus on trying to improve the pace of innovation within the transportation industry within Pennsylvania. RD&D is the label we've given it, research, development, and deployment. And honestly, the last D is the largest struggle, the deployment piece. There's still opportunities to improve how we do research. We're working better together today than we did many years ago as far as working with industry and recognize the needs for doing some research and putting a focus on things, getting things moving forward. When we come out of that, we do pilots, we test things, prove things that can work. And then it's kind of, yeah, if you want to, do it. If you don't want to do it the old way, that's fine. The only time we're really successful at deployment is if we take away the old way of doing things and replace it with the new. And that's, that's a problem. Because it's human nature to continue to do what you know how to do. And if we want to go to the next step, continue to, continue to evolve from an innovation perspective, we need to deploy those new concepts, grow that into our program. We all recognize that a new process or, or a new procedure might cost some money when you're piloting it. You can't let that scare us off on what the future is and how we can be effective with that in the future and drive that cost back down. As long as the innovation with reasonable risk is understood through a pilot scenario to deliver a better performing product, longer performing assets. 40,000 miles of road in Pennsylvania, 25,000 bridges, we've got a lot of opportunity and the cash flow is not there, even with Act 89, to do everything we need to do to renew everything that we have. So we need to be very prudent in what we do for it. So there's some new approaches under, underway currently. Um, as was mentioned earlier, FHWA supports performance engineered mixes with some funding to support that, a full fund study the department's participating in, and it's good to hear that the industry is also going to put some cash forward to participate in that effort forward. And I'm talking more about that. There's some more notes in my slides about this that you'll see later. It'll be on the website, I believe. Uh, but you have a session on that later in this, in this session. Uh, Super Air Meter is a, a tool that's out there now that the department has and we're taking around to plants particularly, uh, precasting plants to, get, to build some knowledge of what the, the product can give us, not just a snapshot of what we have for entrapped and entrained combination air and a lot of assumptions as to what that means for the longer term. But you could do a lot of in-depth testing of that fresh concrete to get a better understanding of how it'll perform. We'll talk a little bit about how to cycle pavements in general and concrete pavements as part of that. So the departments, I'll give you some per perspective of just from an interstate Pardon me, well, at my age, I gotta remove the seeing distant glasses so I can read the paper. This statistic's a little bit surprising to me today. Uh, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the work that we've done since Act 89, but there's a longer story for this too. Right now, our interstate system is about 9% out of cycle as far as reconstruction. 9% is not that huge, um, but it's still out of cycle. 9% of that network needs to be reconstructed. In the next 10 years, we expect about, now this is basically projections based on age, 1135 segment miles that will be out of cycle for reconstruction. So that means we need to pick up the pace because the system is aging, we're going to need to be able to replace those. And that's opportunities for the industry to recognize forward, to be ready for, to be aligned with. The department needs to put plans together to be able to deal with these things, and we need to have industry folks on board with how we're going to do that. Just a little bit of what we've done since Act 89. 49 miles have been reconstructed of interstate. About half of that, 25 miles, were concrete. So we've been doing some work, and we've kept it at that 9% rate. But there's an opportunity for the future for lots of work. It's 
so we deal with our aging infrastructure. I wanted folks to understand that there's plenty of opportunity forward and that the industry has an opportunity to understand how they can be engaged with the department and plans to address those. Been in Pennsylvania for 30 years in uh, the transportation industry, and it's always been a collaborative approach. But it's, it's so so much better of a collaborative approach as of late, and I'm very appreciative of that. The transportation quality initiative that was underway whenever I came into this position has been evolving over the past year. Uh, we took away some of the redundant efforts relative to the technical side of things that TQI was focusing on um, to try to help recognize the quality improvement committees that we have and their opportunities to carry those initiatives forward. So the restructuring of the TQI leadership area is going to pick up on those technical opportunities for innovation improvement, pick the right bucket to send them to, whether it's a quality improvement committee, whether it goes to a research program, and try to keep tabs on things, work with STIC to try to keep that initiative tied together. Um, but the biggest effort has been all the evolution of partnering uh, in the past year at a much more rapid pace. I think that was recognized initially as TQI was developed as one of the needed opportunities within industry, and there's been a great movement within all of our organizations to try to improve partnering relationships, down to our construction winter schools having industry involvement in every district across the state. Uh, the um, APC folks are going out to each engineering district having very high level strategic discussions with the districts about opportunities forward. It's been great in evolution and it needs to continue to evolve. But those quality improvement committees, be they through the aggregate group, the concrete pavement group, the cement mixes groups, will have the challenge of taking those opportunities forward from a technical perspective and working to a point where we can say, here's, here's how this new concept can be evolved into our program. And oh, by the way, here's a recommended deployment procedure so we can carry that out into the future. So that's a challenge for the quality improvement committees. For the As was mentioned earlier, work zone safety is of great concern to the industry and to the department. There is legislation that's being developed for the automated work zone speed enforcement. The department, the turnpike, the industry all support this effort. Uh, as long as we can align things with it being enforceable from a, from a state police perspective, I think we'll get somewhere with this and get folks to slow down and reduce those risks. I don't want anybody hurt through our work zones, whether that's traveling public or whether that's our workers who are out on, on the highway. We have had opportunities over the past to build more state police and local police involvement in our projects. That helps to slow traffic down, but we can't turn this entire ball over to the state police or to the local police to carry for us. There's emerging work zone intrusion technology. There's some devices that have had been used in Pennsylvania that are a great start in certain industries. And we heard at the APC conference, some organizations have developed cutting edge technology for signaling work zone intrusion issues to keep workers safe. We need to all keep our, keep in mind opportunities to bring that into the fold as we develop our work, work zones forward. So since Act 89, you can see how the program was in, was ramped back up. 2.56 billion dollars last year in construction work, contract work, and our projection is 2.4 billion dollars at least forward. So it's sustainable opportunity to build sustainable organizations to carry this work out into the future. Last week, the governor, it was two weeks ago now, two weeks ago, the governor announced a $300 million program over a five-year period to focus department force efforts on secondary roads, and that trickles up into the larger program. So if department forces are out doing paving work now and we can do lower cost treatments on secondary roads with the capacity that we have, we can only get so much done. Those county funds become available for paving projects, those paving project monies can go into higher level projects. So it's, it gives us an opportunity to affect more of the assets with the dollars that we have. There's also a focus on local bridges with that $300 million program over five years. 
We've worked hard in the last 10 years to bring our structured efficient bridge numbers down from the 6,000 plus range to just over 3,000 on the state system. 30% of the local system is still structurally deficient, so that's the need and that's the effort for us, trying to help them bring their local bridge system up and reduce their structural deficient scenarios for poor bridge condition. This slide shows you how the workload's been distributed over the last few years and what the projection is for 2018. These are approximations as far as highway versus bridge. Miscellaneous contracts with pavement, markings, guide rail contracts, things like that. There will be fluctuation as we move forward, but you're looking for an expectation in the future of 55 to 65 percent highway, 25 to 35 percent bridge. Every year will be a little bit different. But again, a sustainable approach with a $2.4 billion program. And every year this graph will look different. It fluctuates from region to region, district to district. Notice that District 11's area has a very large volume of blue, a lot of bridge effort needed in the, in the District 11 area. Some areas are more focused on roadway improvements. Materials quantities projections are shown here. Again, those numbers will fluctuate from year to year, but one thing to note is that the concrete lines, the concrete paving lines, the third line down, has not been sustaining the number that it started out a couple years ago, it's drifted off a little bit. So that's opportunity for our districts to recognize the need to put together programs to keep you know, the program more balanced and back on track. Key to note, about 13 projects in 2018 are going to be 20 plus million dollars. There's a listing of the specific projects in the, in the notes for this. I'll let you look at that on your own. There are some larger projects in the pipeline in 2018 and forward. Long life concrete paving perspective, two projects are planned to be let in 2018 to advance long life applications. And there have been several in the past that have proven successful, successful deployment. We need to continue to improve our quality efforts to make sure that we keep that recognized as a the tactic forward. Full specification deployment is recommended, not bits and pieces. We need to be consistent in how we do it. One thing we've noted though, the projects have not been huge from a long life payment perspective, and the projects have been running about 20% over cost from standard concrete payment. Okay, as we grow the program forward, I expect that that will come down. But we also, what we need to tout is, is the investment worth it. Are we stretching the life of our assets by what we're doing with the long life approach? I think we are, but we need to be, as engineers, able to state how we are, what the maintenance efforts are forward, and how the, the cycles will change so that it's worth the initial investment. One thing it is key to note, though, is that the department has a lot to learn about maintenance cycles on concrete payment. Um, there's out of cycle networks as far as joint sealing out of sight for part of the network as far as valve bar replacements and patching scenarios that we need to catch up on also. And a lot of that's reactionary. And we don't have very much in the way of proactive approach to how we deal with maintaining concrete systems. So we need to consider that forward for the existing system and for all new products. We build. Concrete overlays are a tool in the toolbox that are under deployed in Pennsylvania in my view. It's not new concepts. You may have, if you were here last year, you heard me say that over 30 years ago before I came back to Pennsylvania, I was working in the state of Texas doing a concrete overlay program. Now, it's not the technologies we're using today, uh, and we've learned a lot over time, and occasionally we trip over some things. We've learned some things lately that we need to correct some programs forward so that we don't paint a bad picture as a result of one flaw in the design process that resulted in performance issues. But I think the department has an opportunity to consider concrete overlays more of a tool in the toolbox tool. The Just to give you a little bit of an explanation, the reverse composite is something that kind of is labeled since I've been in this position. Um, it's very similar to a concrete overlay bonded to asphalt. Instead of taking an old asphalt roadway system, 
milling a surface and lining concrete to it. Uh, it's it's an interchange type construction approach where you can do a concrete overlay over new asphalt, but you have to do phases with the, the base course with the, the asphalt material to get yourself enough width to be able to control traffic quickly and then do an overlay project. Something we're considering for the future. The ACPA has a website that indicates where all the overlay locations are, what types they are. If you're not familiar with that, go take a look. I'd like to see the dots continue to grow. For opportunities to show what we're what proving we can do. From Sharp 2 perspective, precast concrete pavements are another tool in the toolbox. And there's opportunities for deploying them. Of course, they are more costly than regular construction, but they are quick in and out. And there are locations where we need that type of approach. There's a project in the pipeline in the District 6 area that's targeting some um, precast concrete pavements. Uh, we've been struggling with getting it on the street with a couple issues, but we're, we're, out, we're going to get a project out there eventually. Uh, Real-time concrete smoothness is another technology that's out there and has been proven to be effective and opportunities for the industry to recognize how we can evolve that into part of standard practice. For our secondary road system, the cement aggregate industry has an opportunity to be involved in full depth recycling. It's another tool to reconstruct gravel or old, worn out, thin asphalt roadways. Uh, the unconventional gas and oil folks have been doing quite a bit of it over the last few years, and that needs to be a tool in the department's toolbox forward also. Um, through Stick, we ran through a, a pilot scenario that gave us a very positive outcome with the cement slurry application for a full depth recycling approach. We've also had pilots relative to Slag Incorporation help stabilize some of those in addition to what's listed here. So if you've got an interest in that from, from your perspective in your organization, continue to dig in and learn because more opportunities are coming. I know you're going to have further details on the bus tour that's coming up for the western part of the state this year later on in your presentations. To get a chance to come to the one out east and speak after the tour. Maybe this time I can even get myself lined up to be on the, on the bus, although you'll have to pull that phone out of my hand so that I can actually see the roads as we're riding around. Um, those are great opportunities to learn, to network, and to look for ways to evolve how we do business forward. So, folks, take advantage of those, and I thank you for coordinating and drawing those types of efforts in the districts to help us support that. And the turnpike will be helping to support this year. I think the Southern Beltway is part of that tour this year. So, with that, thank you for inviting me for the opportunity to open up the presentations here today. I appreciate your interest in the industry. Uh, and again, those that were the last folks standing, look to those that were seated as your mentors as you're trying to carry this organization forward. It's okay to challenge us. Uh, we may tell you what we know just from doing it for forever. Don't just take that as the only way to do things. Please challenge. Thank you.